I'm Brittany Saunders and welcome to Big Business, the place where business is far from boring. And today I'm recording on Gadigal land. Now, I somehow managed to build an empire from the garage underneath my house. And I'm here to share it all with you from the wins, the mistakes, the challenging times and the funny moments in between. So whether you're in business already, perhaps you're not in the game at all. Maybe you're just looking for some inspo or you simply just want to hear the tea when it comes to running a business. This is the podcast for you. Coming up on today's episode, I'm joined by a very special guest and my mouth is actually watering at the theme of today's episode. I'm joined by Johnny, who is the owner and founder of Cake Mail, which is a cake delivery service. They do a lot more than just cakes. They do all sorts of stuff and they do same day delivery made to order in Sydney and they will deliver it to your door. Cake Mail was created to revolutionise the way customers send gifts. The limited options available in Australia's cake and gift-giving industry, particularly for last-minute deliveries, drove the need for innovation, and that's how Cake Mail came to be. Johnny is going to be sharing with us his insights into his unique business, as well as a lot of hilarious stories that aren't so hilarious when they happen, but they're definitely very funny now. Johnny, welcome to Big Business. Thank you for having me. I feel like this is going to be a bit of a delicious episode because your cakes look absolutely amazing. Thank you. I actually saw, I think it popped up, I don't know if it was on my TikTok or my Instagram a a little while ago because we've been trying to get you in for a little while. I know that. You've been off traveling or... Yeah. Were were you traveling? Yeah, I've been traveling heaps. Where'd you go? Um, So I just got back from South America. Oh, wow. Uh, We did Brazil, Colombia and Chile, which was pretty good. Before that, I was in Europe as well. Well, um, welcome so, back. Thank you very much. <laughs> we've, been tr- we've been trying to get you in. You've been gallivanting yeah. around the world. No, nah, I'm glad to be back. I've kind of missed home a bit. Yeah, you do, don't you? Well, I saw a video pop up. Now, did you go on like a morning show or something or on the news? Yeah. Or- so we had a morning show and we had, um, so we had the morning show and then Channel 9 News. Wow. Um, so that was recently because we just launched a cake vending machine. Yeah. Um, inside Westfield Chatswood. Um, and so essentially they were intrigued with, you know, because it's something that hasn't really been done before. Yeah. Um, and so the news love new stuff like that. But yeah. I guess it was our kind of way to do retail without the whole expense of setting up a whole new store. And it makes stuff. sense, especially for you. Like if you, if you are selling something as small as cakes kind yeah. of thing, like do you really need to commit to having an entire shop? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. So the vending machine thing just absolutely caught my eye when I saw that Um video pop up and I've said, we have to get this guy on because I want to hear more about the vending machines and how it all works kind of thing. Yeah. And I haven't watched the video for quite a few months, but I think you were saying something along the lines of how you believe that vending machines are going to be like the way of the future. Yeah. Oh, did you say that? Yeah, well, kind of, it already is because like if you go to like, I don't know if you've been like in Asian countries, but Japan, Korea, they've already started. Like you go out on the streets and there is just vending machines for everywhere. everything. And they sell everything. Yeah, um, wow. and I feel it feel like just we're makes so sense. Behind. And we're, we are we're so far behind <laughs> because we we're very traditional with our with our retail and stuff. And so I feel like eventually we're yeah. going to get there, but we're just someone has to do it. So that's why we're like, you know, let's do it, um, and let's start the trend. What was it going to Japan or something that inspired yeah. you? So to I saw him in Japan. Wow. Um, and then even in in Vegas, like America's starting to kind of jump on it too. So they have a lot of you know vending machines in in, the, in their casinos yeah, and stuff. I think the only vending machines that I've really seen, I've seen like beauty brands do it. Like I know, um, like Kylie Jenner's cosmetics. I've seen yeah. vending machines of that. I think I've seen the sprinkles cupcakes over yeah. in America. Like yeah. I think they started that a little while ago yeah. over there. And then, yeah, I've never been to Japan, but I can only imagine they've probably got vending machines yeah. for absolutely They're literally everything. everything. There's everything. Like I've it. even seen like vending machines for shoes. Like, like, or like emergency shoes on a night out. Like if girls are wearing heels and their feet are hurting, there's vending machines that have little like ballet flats in them and you can buy them. It's kind of oh, smart. A good idea. Um, that's a really good idea. What did get going into this whole vending machine thing look like for you? Like, did you have to, like, so you've obviously just got the one vending machine at yep. the moment in Westfield Chatswood. First of all, how did you organize that with Westfield? Like I obviously, I have two, um, Westfield stores myself. So I know what it's like to go and get a commercial lease and do all yeah. that kind of stuff. But if you just want to plonk one vending machine in a Westfield, how does that work exactly? It's not easy. It's like, it's, it's not, not as, like, I know getting a store sounds like hard and as you know, it is hard, but it's vending machine. It's like, it's, it's as hard yeah. because it's, you're trying to lease a space. You're trying to get them to create a space for you as well, because legally they need like all the permissions and rights and stuff. And Coca-Cola own a lot of the, 
the spaces too. Yeah, right. Um, so it wasn't easy to get stuff. a space and they don't just give it out to anyone either. So I had to full, like do a whole, you know, business proposal and say, you know, because it's such a new concept as well. They don't want to just put something random in there that's not going to work. Yes. Um, so I think it helps that we had a brand behind us and that we could, you know, use that space accordingly. But it, was, it wasn't it was easy to get the approval to do it. So you really. kind of had to say, this is us, this yeah. is our business, this is how many yeah. customers we have, this is our product. Yeah, exactly. And we, here's we why I think thing. it will yeah. be amazing in yeah. your centre. And then have they got you on like a lease? Yeah, essentially, yeah. Oh, it's, and is it's a lease, yeah. Because I know like with our commercial leases for our Westfield stores, it's based off the square meterage of the shop. Are they charging you based off the square I think meterage? they just charge us per the for the spot. Like it's like it's like a whole different department. It's just for vending. Wow. Yeah. It's so interesting to me. And do you have plans to, I think you said in the, like when you went on the morning show that you are hoping to expand and do more vending machines? Yeah. So we're looking into buying a few more already. The first one was kind of just a test to see how it's going and, you know, what we need, because we've never done this before. So we kind of wanted to learn, you know, what we need to get right, um, what products sell well, what spot, like we've moved the vending machine in a few different spaces within that same shopping center so we know have you noticed a drastic difference yeah. like moving yeah. it around yeah what the do position you find is so important like it kind of depends like when we had it near the um the car park it did better because people were kind of buying it on their way out yeah where as opposed to when we had it in the middle of the shopping center it wasn't doing as well because people were too already caught up in shopping and stuff um so kind of now we're testing it in a food court area too but we still kind of found that the ones the one when it was near the um the exit that's where it did the best and that makes the most sense because you're on your way out you've done your shopping you've stopped thinking about all the things you needed to get and you're on the way to the car and then you look and there's this vibrant orange yeah. vending machine with all these beautiful cakes in it you're like, oh, fuck it, I'll get one. Yeah. I'll get one on the way out. Yeah. I'll get a little treat for That's myself. Found, yeah. Or if you're going to someone's house, you'd be like, oh, I could get that yeah. and take that. It's like an impulse buy on your way out. Yeah. What has been the most challenging part of this whole vending machine venture so far for you? I think our thing, with because of stock, like we've never done retail before. Like we've yeah. always had pre-orders and we, we know how to allocate, uh, especially with stock management. Mm-hmm. So with vending machines, obviously when you have something in there for too long, it goes off. Yeah, We're that would throw be it a away. tricky thing. Like... So it's kind of managing wastage and managing stock levels. So we know, you know, how much the right amount to put in so we don't have to throw anything out because they only last a certain amount of time. Yes. So we've never had to deal with wastage before. So that's been a big, that's been a big challenge for us. Yeah, that would be, especially because, you know, the, the other half of your business or like your business is like cakes that just go out and the customer gets them and they're happy. Yeah. Whereas now you've got this vending machine, you're going to have to be keeping your eye on when am I putting the stock in there? When do I need to pull it out? When does it become not good enough yeah, to eat anymore? Exactly, yeah. And what have you found has been the most popular selling item in your vending machine? Um, so we probably the Biscoff one. The Biscoff one's always done really well in yep. the Oreo one. Um, we've just introduced cake jars as well. Um, and we did that because we wanted to sell something at a lower price point just to test to see, you know, if lower costing items did better. And they are, they're doing pretty well. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of been a mix so far. But yeah. we still want to put a few more products in there to kind of test. Like we want to throw some cupcakes in there. We want to throw some like bigger priced items, like whole cakes in there. How later. does it, how does it, uh, cause I remember seeing it in the video. Like, is it one of those machines that goes up and like carefully picks it yeah. up and then brings it yeah, back down? Yeah, it's like a conveyor belt. So it's essentially, it goes up and then it like rolls it onto this platform and then it brings it back down and then it rolls it back out. Cause I'd be worried if it, you're doing like a big cake in there that it's going to like smash. Yeah. Have you had anything go wrong like that? Not yet. No, no, okay, it's not, wood. it's not possible. Luckily, like, because it, if it just dropped down, it, the whole thing would ruin. <laughs> drop not, it down like normal, a coat bottle. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't just drop down. A lot of people think that because they think they go and they, the thing just drops down. But it's not a normal vending machine. Right. It's, it's like a very high-tech vending machine. I can imagine that um, a piece of equipment like that was super expensive to make. Yeah. And yeah. especially customizing yeah, it. Yeah. So essentially the, how we got it, it's, it's like it's a white label thing. So the, the technology already exists. Yeah. Um, and then we just white label it essentially. Which for people that are listening that don't know what white labeling is. Yeah. So white labeling is when you just buy, I don't know, depending on what the, whatever space you're in, you just buy something that's already made and you kind of rebrand it to to be your own essentially. Yeah. So you've found a company that kind of makes these vending machines, the technology's there, and then you can wrap it and make your own. Yeah. And then you imported that into the country. Yeah. How the hell did you get the vending machine in the, I can only imagine the customs and the. Don't even get me started. (laughs) I Even can only just imagine. Even it into the Westfields, like we had to, 
you, if, if I show you the videos of it going, we were wheeling it on the road and then wheeling it into the front door of the Westfield. Oh, no. And I'd be so worried. it was too big for the elevator. So we had to literally wheel it. Like it was, it was like four people trying to push this big, thing. and it's massive as well. It's not small. Yeah, it's two point two meters high. I would be so worried, especially because it is like a, it's technology in a box. I'd be worried that one little thing would come loose, and then the whole machine wouldn't work. Like if you're wheeling it down the street, I'd be freaking out that yeah. I was going to break the machine. Yeah, no, we've been through that. Don't worry, we've been oh, <laughs> multiple can, times as well because we've had to move it. I can Moving only, it is the worst thing. I can only imagine. When's the next one, if there is one? Um, we're looking into getting three more. Wow. Um, and hope- you're going to go Westfields every time? Well, it's interesting because we've had a lot of, since we've launched, we've had a lot of other companies reach out to us wanting to get these machines. Because at first it was so hard just to get anyone to take it. Mm-hmm. And now since, you know, we got featured on TV and all that, everyone's like jumping at us to get it. So we've had unis approach us. We've Ooh, had that would like be a good one. RSL clubs approach us. We've had hospitals approach us so oh, it's kind hospitals. of like that's a good yeah one. so it's kind of like an eye opener to see what are we we don't know what to do yet because it's like these could be do 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 better than shopping centers we don't know like hospitals like it's such a um it's a good thing if you want to take a gift to a yeah, patient if someone's having a tough time in hospital give them a beautiful cake yeah wow i guess another thing that i haven't thought as well what is the benefit to let's say westfield for them with you having your vending machine in there? Because, again, I know the way that it works when you have an actual store in Westfield. I yeah. know that you pay them rent and all that kind of yeah. stuff. Is that all they're getting from you or are they taking a cut, if you're allowed to yeah. say? <laughs> um, it's just been rent at the moment. Yeah. I'm not sure. I know they do take commission. I'm not sure off vending. I think vending's a bit different. Yeah. Not like it's retail. Um, but, yeah, no, it's, it's literally just rent. It, so you're quite literally just paying for the yeah, space. And yeah. the same goes for any traditional retail store in a Westfield. Like, you are just essentially paying them rent. And what they will do and what may be in your contract with them as well, which is in our contracts, is each retailer, um, they give you a like a threshold. And yeah. if in a year you make above that threshold, they then take a percentage of every dollar above uh, that threshold. So, so you might want to look at... have to do? Yes, but, and it's all calculated off the square meterage. So I'm not sure if they do the same for the vending machines, but every single store, let's say like Apple, for example, like their store's huge. Um, so then that number for them is really high kind of thing. Yeah. And the numbers that they give you is high to the point where it's almost not achievable. We get pretty close, but I haven't had to give Westfield a percentage of our sales. Like we've just come under yeah. each year, which is good. Cause it's hard because f- it's like a catch-22 though. I know. It's like you want to make more you wanna sales. You want to make more, yeah. But then if you're making more, then you've got to start paying for it. Yeah, and it's every dollar above that amount that you make. It's... um it's not every dollar you've made before then kind of thing. So let's say, for example, it's $1.5 million in the year. Any dollar above $1.5 million, they will take a percentage of every dollar above that. And it's negotiable what that percentage is. And we haven't, we haven't just hit it, but I know when we were getting close to it in like our first year of our Westfield Miranda store, I was saying to my partner, AJ, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> like we need to stop making money because I didn't want it to get to that point. But like you said, it's like a double-edged sword. Yeah. You want to make more money, but then you know if you make a little bit too much, then you're going to actually make less. Yeah. So I'm not sure if it'd be the same for you with those. Yeah, I don't think yet, but who knows, who knows? maybe down the track they might yeah. enforce it. I don't know. Let's go back to Cake Mail. Um, I was reading up on your website and you started baking when you were in high school, when yeah, you were really young. 16 pretty much. Well, even before that, like I always had it as a hobby. But yeah. 16 is when I started the business. And it was just, you always liked baking from when you were really yeah. young. Yeah. And then you just thought, what, I'm going to start, were you selling them to friends and family? Yeah. First it was friends and family and then yep. it kind of was like the whole word of mouth thing from there. Yeah. But I literally did it out of my garage. From yeah. home. So first it was in my mum's kitchen. Wow. And then she got, she cracked it because there was, we turned the whole house into a business. <laughs> we had all these people rocking up to the house and orders galore everywhere. And the whole place was a mess. So, wow. so then we converted the back garage into a whole industrial kitchen. Wow. Um, and then from there, because we outgrew that, then we moved into a warehouse. 
Yeah, well, I feel like most businesses start that way. Like my business yeah. started in the garage yeah. underneath my house. Yeah. Um, you can't have it any other way. No. And I think it's really special to be able to start a business that way, to start it from quite literally nothing, yeah. just you making these cakes at home kind of thing, to then fully turning into a proper business yeah. with a warehouse. And for those who haven't seen your business before, you do a lot, like I've, I've been stalking the Instagram, like you do all sorts of cakes, you do cupcakes, you do the cakes where you pull the... Yeah, the lift up ones, yeah. The yeah, the, and then it all like falls down. And so you do also like same day delivery in Sydney or something like that? Yeah, yeah. So same day was kind of our main like competitive point with our business because we were the first people in Sydney to do same day cake delivery. Um, and that's kind of what tipped our business over the edge because... Um, like everybody makes cakes, but what makes your cakes different to everyone else? And our thing was the service because we're mm. like birthday cakes, especially are the single most forgotten thing on a birthday, yet they're <laughs> most important. Yeah. Um, and so that, like, we always saw that as a gap because when I was running my business before that, um, I was thinking people were always so last minute to organize cakes yep. and they always wanted them delivered. So I'm like, imagine there was somebody that you could just order off and it would come to you. So then I saw us like, you know, we're like now the Uber Eats of birthday cakes. Wow. Um, and how do you orchestrate that from your end? Obviously, do you just have to have a certain amount ready kind of thing? We make everything to order. Wow. Um, but so it, if someone could order in the morning. Yeah. So we have up till 12 o'clock today. But it took us a very long time to get that process Yeah, because right. I was thinking maybe you would have like 20 Biscoffs done and 20 cookies and yeah. cream or We have whatever. a couple. Yeah. Because we know we're going to sell them. Yeah. Um, but eventually when a certain time hits, we just literally make to order because we don't want to like have stuff there ready for the next day. Like we want everything out fresh. Yeah. Wow. Um, so the process we've got is it's we've, we've nailed it. Wow. Um, but it took us a very long time to get it right. Yeah. A very long I th- time. I think that's a thing that a lot of people, again, can be misled with in business is it takes so long to get to a point where everything is perfect. Yeah. Much like you with your vending machines and right now going, we're just testing it out. We don't know what we're doing. And I'm sure, you know, if it all goes well for you with these vending machines in three years from now, you can be like, look at where we are yeah. now with these vending machines. Yeah. And you can look back and compare to now when you've got the one vending machine, yeah. how different it'll be. Business is always a journey, yeah. I would say, and it takes forever to get to that good point. But I personally believe even when you think you're at the good point, you're not. You're not. Yeah, There's you know, always yeah. so much more yeah, that so you true. can improve on. Yeah. How does your team look with the cakes? Like if you're making them to order kind of thing, like how many people have you got baking every day? What does that look like? Yeah, we have got a good team. We've got about, uh, in the kitchen, we've got about eight or so people. Yep. Um, and then we have a whole team of drivers as well. So we do all our deliveries in-house as well. Wow. Um, because that was another challenge we had with our business. When Whenever we sent them out with couriers and stuff, they would just treat them like they were nothing. Like they'd throw yeah. them away. They'd be melted. They wouldn't arrive the way that they're meant to. So we had to then go and invest all our resources into setting up a delivery network. So like the, all the drivers, we basically, they basically work for us. Yeah, wow. Um, so it, cause it took us a while to get that as well. I could only imagine. We have um, said before that some, like one day we want to do like a delivery, because we're based in Newcastle, we want to do like a delivery day in Newcastle, you know, like same day delivery or whatever. And I've said to my partner, AJ, how would we even like work out what suburb you go to first and like what would yeah. be the loop? So I could imagine it would have yeah, been the same yeah, for you so as long. well. Yeah, it was such a... Especially such with Sydney, like there's so many more suburbs here. Yeah. So much more traffic. Like, how do you even orchestrate yeah. something like that? Logistics is the hardest part of our business. Like, everybody asks me, like, what's the hardest part? Logistics is the worst part. Yeah, Because wow. it's people, when, especially when you're dealing with emotions and people gifting, mm. everybody, when you give some, like, something to someone, you want it to be perfect, right? So you're going to have people on the other end saying, please make sure this cake is delivered by three o'clock. Or it's going to a school, this person leaves at two o'clock, it has to get there at this time. Mm. Or... It's in the hospital, in the maternity ward, but you can't get through. You need it like, and there will be like 10 million instructions attached to it. Yeah. Um, and so trying to get everyone's delivery perfect to how the customer wants it, it doesn't always happen. Like no. things, shit happens. It or really a, does. Like a driver will get into a car accident and all the cakes will be damaged. So Has like, that will, happened? Yeah, multiple times. Oh. Yeah. Shit happens. Or a, a, a driver will get to a house and there will be a dog and the dog will be barking at them. He can't even cross. And the dog, like one time a dog literally jumped the fence and was chasing the driver. Oh. <gasps> With the cake. <laughs> no. 
And the hard thing is as well, like stuff like this happens in business every day and customers, I guess, don't see that side. No, not and at all. even as like, especially like you said, if it's a cake and if it's something special and you're like, I'm so sorry, but the drive has been chased yeah. down the road by a dog and his legs been bitten yeah. and the cake smashed on the ground. I think a lot of the times the customers don't care they that that care. happened because care. it's their special yeah. moment with their cake. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I needed the cake. Like, where is yeah. it? And I can understand their point of view. Yeah. But also, like you said, like shit happens in business all the time that is completely out of your yeah. control. What would you say in your, how many years have you been doing cake mail? Cake mail has been seven years now. Wow. Yeah. Well done. Thank you. Um, what would you say has been the biggest mistake or disaster in that time? Um, so I remember one time there was, so like I've done multiple roles. So I, I always taught myself every single role of the business. And so whenever I was needed to do that role, say like, you know, a staff was sick or couldn't rock up or we needed extra help, I would know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so on Christmas, the, the admin, she couldn't rock up, she was sick. So I had to do that role. And now yeah. I hadn't done that role probably in about two years, even though I learned that role and I curated that role, I completely forgot how to do it because I'm not very tech savvy. Right. So You're more hands-on. That, yeah, I'm more hands-on. <laughs> I'm more creative. But that role was more so like Excel-based and like exporting all the orders and um, pretty much doing the logistics part of it and creating like the labels and the order list. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I clicked a few wrong buttons. Oh, um, no. And essentially, and we didn't know this until the orders went out when we started getting emails saying, hey, I've received the wrong cake. Oh, and I'm like, oh, no, shit. no. And it happened again and again and again. I'm like, and it literally happened to every single order. And so essentially what happened was in Excel, we have, we sort the orders alphabetically, but I sorted the cakes alphabetically. <gasps> oh, no. So every single <laughs> and so customer. every single person got the wrong cake. On, and it was just all orders <laughs> and it was from on one. Christmas. On Christmas Day or like just before Christmas? No, it was Christmas. It was Christmas Eve. So pretty much, it was our last delivery day. So pretty much I ruined Christmas for <laughs> for about 300 and something people. <gasps> You are the Grinch. Literally. literally. And were all the were all, all the cakes Christmas theme? Some of them were, but some of them weren't. So like people were getting like happy birthday cakes no. on Christmas. <laughs> or like we had we have like a selfie cake where you upload like oh, your photo. No. So some people so were getting, getting random people <laughs> on their cake. <laughs> what year was this? This was like oh I'm gonna say two thousand and 19, 2020. It was just before COVID. So you ruined Christmas COVID. for so many yeah. people. Yeah. Were some people like... Some people were all right. Were they it, funny about it? Some people like, were funny, but it was kind of like, it didn't matter. Like it was like, and you can imagine like it back, like it, it felt so bad. And it was like, like we had to refund 350 people. <gasps> like it was just shit. It oh, was, no. it was not good at all. Were some people raging? Yeah. I could yeah, imagine. Some people would be sure. raging. Some people would find it funny. It's like you've ruined Christmas. Oh, oh no. Wow. I mean, if you don't laugh, you cry, right? And I, I feel yeah. like these things happen in business and at the time you definitely wouldn't have been laughing. Yeah. No. I would have felt sick and not been able to yeah. sleep. <laughs> Couple of days I was out. But now but now you laugh about it. It's always yes. like the, the bad ones, the bad stories that you remember and you tell people and you always laugh about them. Exactly right. And it's from those times where, yeah, that was absolutely fucked when you ruined Christmas for 300 people. But you can look at it now, laugh. Yeah. And I'm sure you learn a lot of lessons yeah. from that. Yeah. Like I will Every time I do, do that, that role again. now, I always go back to that and I'm like, make sure you've done this right. Yes, 100%. How did you recover from that in the end? Like obviously um, you Well, we're, we're really good with our customers. And I've always believed that you need to, especially with our business, because our business relies on repeat customers over and over. Like if you fuck up their cake once, they're not going to order a few again. So mm. you need to keep them on your side. Um, so with us, we refunded every single person. And then we also gave them a $25 store credit mm-hmm. to use as an incentive on their next order. Yeah. Did you find that a lot of them came back again? Yeah. Most of them, look, most people will understand. Yeah. You're going to have your, your handful of people that probably just fed up and not going to come back, but you yep. can't do anything about it. It's always going to happen. You can't keep everyone happy. The ones that you can't keep happy, you don't really want them in the, at the end of the day. Because they're just going to always find something to pick. Oh, I I feel you. I literally got an email this morning from a customer saying that um, she hopes that karma gets me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a new one. Yeah. (laughs) Like I got the most horrible email. (laughs) But um, because we um, rejected her return because like... When you're returning, so like we get returns yeah. back with our clothes, which is a whole other part of business. Like you wouldn't have returns on cakes, yeah. I'm sure. 
and it has to be in like a hundred percent original condition. Um, if it's got like pet hair or like smells really strong yeah, of, of something, you can't resell it. We, yeah, we can't fold it back up nicely and put it on the on the shelf and sell it again. And so we're just the worst people in the world. Um, for rejecting her return, even though we sent it back to her at our own cost. And we're like, you know, usually we'd charge someone to be like, here, you're going to have to have it back and you're going to have to pay for the shipping. Yeah. We sent it back to her and yeah, she said that um, <laughs> she she hopes that karma gets me, but you can just literally oh, yeah. never make anyone, like everyone happy. You get a like lot of that said. though, like with people buying stuff, wearing it and then returning it. Like, do you see a lot of that? We would. Yeah. And like, it's a really shady part of yeah. this industry, I guess, is people would buy something like carefully take the tag off, wear it and put the tag back on and That's send so it back. But our warehouse team are pretty thorough yeah, when it comes to checking for. returns. Yeah. And like, you can kind of tell when something has been worn and like we fucking smell stuff. Like it's really gross, but we like check yeah. over it because you yeah. just want it to be perfect, you know? So yeah, I totally agree with you that you can't make everyone happy when you're in business. I think a lot of people naturally are people pleasers. We want to make everyone happy. Like that's just who we are as humans. But I think being in business will give you the biggest wake up call. Yeah, You literally can't make everyone happy. Some people are going to absolutely hate your guts. Yeah, And it took me a long time to learn that as well because we were always wanting to make everyone happy. And every time we'd get like a complaint or something, it would really hit me hard. Because we work so hard to, to build the business to that point, right? And so whenever you get people that aren't happy, like, I've, like it took me a while to sit there and say, it's okay. It's fine. Like you're always going to have people that aren't going to be happy and that's fine. You I, can't give everyone I happy. Couldn't, you're speaking my own language, honestly. And I think it's really important that to all business owners out there, no matter where you are yeah. in your journey, you have to yeah. know it's okay yeah. if people hate your business. Yeah. And you just got to let go. Like you, you actually do. just have to let go. You can't Otherwise, micromanage you're gonna, every little, little thing. Yeah. You're going to spend all of your energy for the whole day on that customer that's going yeah. off at you or whatever. When you kind of just have to go, all right, well, I'm going to close this ticket now yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and uh, wish, you, wish you the best kind of thing. What else in your business journey so far have you found to be surprising or challenging? Yeah. So during like COVID, especially in the midst of COVID, like a lot of businesses were closing down. And then, but it was funny because our business was doing the opposite. Our business was the like doing so, it was getting busier and busier and busier. We couldn't even manage it. Like mm. our business went 10 times in sales over the course of, you know, the two weeks. And then every time there was like another lockdown, it would go even more and more and more because our business was like one of the only ones that could operate because we were food delivery. Mm. So we got around it. And so during COVID, it was like we had to keep hiring staff. We had to, like we're operating our business at a level that we didn't even know how to because it was like 10 times production. And so it was just crazy. Like I've never ever seen the business at that point ever. And we'll never ever get there again because it was like, People were ordering it because we were one of the only things open. Yeah, wow. Um, especially with gifting and stuff. Like, you couldn't see your friends, so you would have to send them something. Yes. Um, and so, COVID was a big surprise for us because I didn't expect our business to do that. And then ever since doing that, we've retained a lot of our customers from it. Um, so, so it's it was, almost like COVID was like an amazing thing yeah, for you. Yeah. I feel like for a lot of businesses, it either was like a make or break for them. Yeah. I feel like for online businesses, online businesses boomed in COVID because everyone was at home. Everyone was getting the COVID payments off the government kind of thing. And they were just spending yeah. money online. I know for us as well, we only had our one retail store at the time in Newcastle. So that shut, which was fine because it was just our one little yeah. Newcastle boutique, but our online sales went up as well, especially yeah. because when we first went into lockdown, it was like the weather was cooling down. We were coming out with all of our trackies and hoodies. Yeah. So it was like so perfect. Because people were just buying trackies and hoodies to sit at home on Zoom with their friends. Um, I guess, how did you, because I've heard a lot of stories from business owners and I have friends who are business mentors and coaches and um, they've said a lot of businesses that did peak in COVID have really struggled since because they, they saw this boom in COVID and they thought, oh, this is amazing. Like, this is yeah. what it's going to be now. Yeah. And then when things went back to normal, they felt their business yeah. slow down yeah. again. Did you experience I agree. the yeah. same yeah. thing? Yeah, I think we had the same thing. Although I knew it wasn't here to stay mm. um, because obviously it's only increasing because of COVID. So what's going to happen when COVID stops? So I yeah. kind of had that in the back of my mind. 
but because the business went so well, we and we were forced to grow at a rate that we like we weren't ready for. So yeah. we moved into a bigger warehouse. We hired all these staff. We we implemented all these new processes. And so when we went back to normal, mm. it was like we had all this space, all this stuff, and we didn't have the you know the orders for it. Yeah. So it was how kind did of you, like, how did you manage that? Like, we had what? to like descale. So we went from scaling up to we literally had to scale everything back down. Did you have to let people go from there? Yeah, we positions? had to. We had no choice. But as that kind of happened and as COVID went away, more jobs became people went back to the original jobs. Because yep. we during COVID we employed a lot of people that lost their jobs. Right. Um and I employed a lot of family as well because they all lost their jobs. So it was like we were like one of the only people imp- employing people. Like yeah, wow. at one stage we had over a hundred drivers. Wow. Like it was just it was just crazy. I've never seen the business, like there was cake everywhere. <laughs> like, even the new warehouse we moved into was not big enough. So we had to make a makeshift warehouse outside. We put all these marquees and tents outside so we could literally produce cakes outside. That's crazy. <laughs> like I can't even explain it. You couldn't even walk on the floor because there was just shit everywhere. You couldn't oh my move. Like goodness. it was at a level where I didn't think it was possible at all. Yeah. Wow. Business really is just one massive whirlwind, isn't it? Yeah. To wrap up the episode, where do you see the future of Cake Mail going? And I guess looking back on your seven-year journey, did you ever think that you would be where you are now when you first started? Because I think that's a big thing for a yeah. lot of business owners is they start this little thing at home and then it turns into something massive. You yeah. know, what is your overview of your journey and what are your goals for yeah. the future, if any? It's kind of crazy because when I started it, I literally started it in my garage. Um, and especially because... Uh, I was never meant to do this, but my mum never wanted me to do this. She wanted me to go to uni, yeah, which so I what, did. What did you want to do originally, or did you always want to? I never, I do never the knew case. what I wanted to do because I was so young. Yeah, I knew I liked doing this, but it was never meant to go this well. It was never meant to be a business like for this. <laughs> and so, kind of when it took off, it was like, all right, this this is pretty cool, and I like doing it. Um, and I've always, I've never seen myself working for anyone either. Mm. Um, so it's crazy when I look back now, um, to see what it's become. It's like I didn't think it'd ever get to this stage, never. Um, so I'm happy with where it's gotten. Um, and I guess kind of the goals now is to kind of push it to where else it can be. Yep. Um, and that's kind of with the vending machines, um, because it's like with our business, especially there's only so many birthdays on so many days. So it's kind of like once you hit that, it's hard because you can't really grow much more. Mm-hmm. Like we've hit all the other, like, you know, Valentine's Day, Father's Day, Mother's Day, like we've done all that. Um, but w- our next step was always retail. And that's why I see with the vending machines, if we can get it right, I think that's probably our next way forward. Yeah, I love that. And would you ever open, like I know we're talking about vending machines and saying you don't need a lease, but would you ever open your own like little cafe shops? Yeah, look, I've thought about it, but I I feel like the main thing with our brand is that our different point is that we don't have a shop. We are online same day cake delivery Yeah, and I don't want to cannibalize the whole business by opening a shop. Yeah. And a shops are hard, let me yeah, tell you. Yeah. <laughs> shops I definitely are hard. wouldn't mind opening up a shop one day, but probably not with this brand, like probably with something else. Yeah, wow. And yeah. have you thought the other way, like expanding into, let's say, supermarkets where you're selling to them at yeah. wholesale? So we've recently launched into IGA. Oh, wow. Um, so there you go. Only, you're doing it all yeah, already. <laughs> <laughs> we're only testing out a couple of stores to see kind of how it works. Yep. But yeah, it's still kind of like playing at the moment. But yeah, it's definitely something we could look into. Like, especially with the Woolies and Coles, that would be cool because they've obviously got more of a reach. Absolutely. You just have to be mindful of your margins at that point because I know they take a lot. And also, you have no control over the price they um, sell your products at. Wholesale is hard as well. It's like it's another whole world. I I cannot even begin to imagine. That was my other question that I had um, for you before. What would you say that you owe all of your success to with Cake Mail? Like, what is it exactly that has, like, obviously you've got your same day delivery, but like, how have you gotten the audience that you have? Like, has it been social media and organic content or has it been paid ads or has it been emails? Like, what would you say has been the biggest, you know, you know what I'm saying? I think out of everything we did, the main thing that we did that like that I physically saw the business like the sales go up was influencers like back in the days when we first started and we were sending out our product to influencers and they were sharing it yeah that's where we got big reach that's where we got a lot of people ordering a lot of like obviously increased followers and things like that that I feel, I feel like that out of everything did the best for us do you think it's still the same today no it's very very different it I is. think influencers um that like it's hard because we, we've we obviously we've tested ongoing influences and it's hard because people kind of know us already. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I feel like with influencers, it best works with like a new product or a new brand. Mm -hmm. But even then, now influencers know their worth and they're charging a lot more for it. Oh, yeah. Like back in the days, we never paid for one influencer. They just wanted a free cake. It was kind of like a privilege for them to be sent a cake. Like yes. we, we kind of flipped it on its head. And now it's like, I'll have the cake, but I also want 10 yeah. grand. Yeah, literally. Yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't get the same pool as it used to because there's a lot more influencers and they're posting a lot more things. And so your product is like drowning in so many other promotions. I completely agree. And I've spoken about this on the podcast before, that influencer marketing like seven years ago was so different. Yeah. Like you could give an influencer a cake and they could post about it and you'd get hundreds of orders. Whereas now you could like give the same influencer a cake and you might get two orders. Yeah. Yeah, like it's, it's, so it's just because yeah. social media is so saturated yeah. now. Oh, I love it. Well, Johnny, I'm going to wrap up today's episode with a question for you. I feel like you've already given us so many little <laughs> tips, but I always do a tip of the week. It can be about business. It can be life. It can be anything in between. What is your tip of the week for us? Yeah. When most business owners speak to me, I always say this one thing to them and they resonate with it well. And I always say, work on the business, not in the business. Because a lot of business owners I meet are always so hands-on in the business they're doing like, you know, packing their orders, they're, they're posting on social media, they're doing this, they're doing that. I'm like, oh, that's, that's great, but what are you doing to actually grow your business? Mm -hmm. What are you doing to make sure your business is not the same as it was yesterday? I absolutely love that. I feel like you're having a go at me as well because <laughs> I'm so hands-on <laughs> that I always do stuff, but I'm totally with you on that. And I think it's really important when we do start new businesses from the ground up, like in our garages, you're making the cakes in your mum's kitchen. It's really important to have your fingers in every part of the business yeah. then and learn all those roles and do all those things and understand how it works. But it gets to a, a point, especially if you are wanting to scale the business, yeah. that you need to step away yeah. from those day-to-day -day yeah, operations. Sure. And I know for me that I found over the years of my journey is I held a lot of guilt around not actually doing those hands-on things. Yeah. Like when I felt myself not packing orders anymore, I would feel guilty that yeah. I wasn't there helping my warehouse team or if I'm not in the store serving customers. Like yeah. I, I found, I don't know if you experienced yeah, that no. as well. It takes a lot to let go of your business. Yes, it you does. You have to like, you know, detach yourself from your business. Your business will live without you. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you will never Like you can't treat it You can't be so emotional With the business Like it took me a long time Because I was so attached to it mm -hmm. Every time something went wrong I was there Whereas now I have people in place That manage it And obviously it doesn't run as well When you're not there it's, yes. I get it You need but, to be there to an extent Yeah But to an extent Like let it fuck up a bit But still let it run by itself Like it's it's, it's, it's own entity now Like it, you don't have to be so attached to it You don't have to be on ac across everything about it. That's solid advice. Write that down, everyone. <laughs> well, Johnny, um, it has been so great to have you on the pod. I'm looking forward to see where you take cake mail next. And hopefully we might have to get a cake mail vending machine in the Fate store or something. <laughs> that would be cool. That would be really cool. <laughs> but put Fate branding all over it and have a, a Fate That'd cake cool. machine. Um, thank you so much for coming on the pod. Where can everyone find you? Obviously, we know you've got your vending machine yep. in Chatswood. Go check it out. Where is it at the moment in the in Westfield Chatswood, in the um, the food court. In the food court. Yeah. If you're at Westfield Chatswood, go and go and uh, get yourself a cake. And where else can everyone find cake mail? Yeah, and then you can just online. So our website, cakemail.com.au, and then you can pretty much pick whatever cake you want, and we deliver. What's your number one suggestion for uh, the Ferrero Fountains? Our bestseller. Ferrero Fountains. So that's Fountain. the one where you lift up the plastic and all the um, the chocolate pours down over the side of the cake. We might have to order one in <laughs> for the Nova office. We could order it today, Xander, and it could be here today. we still got 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Johnny, so much for um, coming on. Thank you for it's having me. It's been great to chat with you. Thank you very much. <laughs>